All right, it's good to see everyone this morning. I um, This has been an amazing week for me, and, and um, the Lord gave me a word uh, last, last week. It's been kind of like mowing over my spirit a little bit. And I found that anytime you want to talk about spiritual warfare, it's like the enemy comes at you a little bit extra hard. You know what I'm saying? So like during the week, um, you know, as I'm putting this together, I probably revise this thing like six times. So I don't know what you're going to get this morning, but I will tell you this. It's going to be motivated, motivated by the heart of God. Amen. And we're just going to kind of roll with it. But um, I do want to, um, this is again, one of these subjects that I like to revisit from time to time because it is a very important subject. We have to understand what we're dealing with. We have to understand the two realms that we work in. There's a spiritual realm. There's a carnal world that we live in. We know all, you know what? We know lots and lots of stuff about the carnal world we live in, do we not? I mean, you can tell anybody, you know, really about anything because we all see it. We live in it. But the spiritual side of things, not so much. And how many know that what happens over here is far more powerful than what happens on this side? And they're both connected. Amen. So I want you to know that. You know, messages like this, when we understand how to win the battle of the mind, that's my title, winning the battle of the mind. When we learn how and we understand how to operate in that and operate in that empowerment, I'm telling you, your walk in Christ does get easier. I'm convinced of it. It's more fulfilling. It's more joyful. Um, you, you, I think we recognize, at least these are some of my experiences, that you, um, um, you, you demonstrate the word of God a little bit more effectively in your life. It's more fulfilling. But I've also noticed too here that, you know, when you, when you start walking in the things of God and start affecting the world around you for the kingdom of God, you know what happens? You experience a little bit more opposition from the enemy as well, right? So people don't like to hear that part of it, but it's not all bad when you experience that. Number one, you got God on your side, but when you, when you experience some pushback from the enemy, it's, it's a very good barometer to let you know that you're actually impacting the word around you. You just have to remember whose side you're on and whose you actually belong to. And, you know, and it does get easier. And God will also use opposition to make us stronger in every situation of life. I mean, the things that we're going against, it's not to knock us down. The enemy wants to destroy us with it. But, you know, the Lord wants to use that. He didn't bring it into our life, but he wants to use it and take it and make us stronger. Amen. And that's the goal. So we're going to look at winning the battle of the mind and taking control of your thought life. And um, I've discovered just over the course of life, this is my own little list here, there's four things that take place from the inception of a thought. First, the thought comes in. Second, it connects to our emotions and how we feel. Then it um, becomes a part of our belief system, right? And then it becomes an action in our life. That's how it works. And in Proverbs 23, 7, it says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. I want you to know the is part of that is the action part. That's the outflow. So everything, every action begins in the mind first. And you know what? What we allow in the mind and what comes into the mind crafts really largely who we are. So we've got to be careful what we are downloading into our spirit. We got to be careful. And sometimes out of no control of our own, what people have spoken over us over the sub total of our lifetime that you've heard over and over again. Trust me, it gets in. We have to be careful what we speak into the lives of people. We've got to be careful what we speak into the lives of our kids. Got to. Even in the midst of correction, which we all fail from time to time, we got to guard what we say to them because the same message being repeated and spoken into the life of a kid will be the outflow of their life as they get over. It's the way it works. So we also have to be careful what the enemy tries to put in, which we're going to talk about and also our own thoughts that we generate as well. So the level of our success is dependent upon winning this battle. So let's look at first, or I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to get on the light more, I can't see. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. It says, Now I, Paul, appeal to you with the gentleness and the kindness of Christ. Though I realize you think I'm timid in person and bold, only when I write to you from far away. Well, I'm begging you now that when I come, I won't have to be bold with those who think and we act from a, from a human motive, from human motives. We are human, but we do not wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning 
and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps us from knowing God. We capture the rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. So right in there, that's, that's a whole thing. If we don't guard what, what, what we allow coming into our mind, it is going to affect our, work, our, our walk in God. It's going to affect how we navigate in our knowledge of God. Amen. That's a, that's a significant verse right there. Verse 6 goes on to say, After you have been fully obedient, we punish everyone who remains disobedient. And the end of verse 5, there, which I didn't read, which is important, we capture the rebellious thought and teach it to obey Christ. You know why you got to teach it to obey Christ? Because there's nothing greater than Christ. You know, Pastor Marlene last week, I think she made a mention about the train or the robe of the Lord. Train of the robe, uh, uh, it's endless. And just to, you know, kind of recite what she said last week, when, when, a, when, a, when a king conquered a nation, that king would cut the robe and, tie, and sew it onto the back of his robe to show power. Isn't it amazing? God's robe his train, and it goes on forever. That means there's nothing that could rise above him. Amen? We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, make it obey to Christ. You might as well go to the top. Verse 7 says, look at the facts. Those who say they belong to Christ must recognize that we belong to Christ as much as they do. I may seem to be boasting too much about the authority given to us by the Lord. If you're born again this morning, say, I have the authority of Jesus Christ. I have the empowerment of Jesus Christ. Same word. Nothing can overtake me. Because of who he is in me. That's power. And I will not be ashamed of using my authority. You step in when you need to wield that power, you wield that power. And I'm telling you, the Spirit of God's going to move right in. It's delegated power. All right, so before we dig down into this verse, I want to further illustrate what I'm talking about um, by talking about what happens when someone has a stroke. I was looking for this example, and I think this fits perfectly. So a stroke in a person, well, let me put it to you this way. You have two carotid arteries on either side of your neck. So they, ca they carry oxygenated blood to your brain. All right, so over the course of our lifetime, due to like poor eating, saturated foods, part of it's hereditary, well, you got these carotid arteries, and what happens is when we have too much fat content in our lives, we gain weight, but there's something else that takes place within the artery. This plaque builds up, and when it builds up, it starts collecting more as life goes on. So this plaque starts moving its way across the artery until the blood flow is now minimized. So what happens is when it goes all the way across, if you're if whatever side of the brain is not getting blood, it's not getting oxygen. And what happens? The body strokes, the brain dies. And then the functionality of that, whatever that part of the brain controls, ceases to function in the natural. That's what happens. So I want you guys to know something as it is in the natural. It's also in the spiritual. And I want you to track with me on this. When you are saved and you are bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, I want you to know all things become new. You're a new creation in him. You're cleansed from all unrighteousness. You're alive in Christ, free of bondage, and you bear the image of Christ. The Bible says that life is in the blood. And I want you to picture something here. I want you to picture right now by virtue of salvation that the oxygen-rich blood of Jesus Christ is coursing through your arteries because he's alive and you're bought by the blood amen but i also want you to know that comes with a warning we need to guard what christ did within our lives because you know what if we keep allowing negative thoughts to come in impure thoughts to come in images whatever might be trying to take root within our lives i want you to picture it is spiritual plaque that is now blocking or, or will potentially block that oxygen rich blood that Christ gives us. And I'll tell you something, when that thing clogs up, we're going to die spiritually. And we've got to guard against that. And I'm telling you, as it is in the spiritual, now it's in the natural. You see, when we're compromised with spiritual plaque, track with me. I'm telling you, this is where dreams grow dim. This is where God given ideas are stolen. It kills our purpose. It kills our direction. It robs you of destiny. So we have to guard this. We have to guard it being rich in the word. 
worshiping, stepping into worship when we don't feel like it. Amen. So I want to, we're going to touch back on that in a minute, but I want to break down this passage here. And just if I were to do a broad sweep, broad stroke across the book of Corinthians, second Corinthians, first and second, Paul does three things. One, he has to defend the, um, the truth of Jesus Christ. Second, he has to defend his apostolic role as a leader. Because as a, as a leader in this church, he wasn't respected, and they didn't see him as legitimate. And third, Paul has to teach them, but not only teach them, he has to bring correction to this wayward church. And I'm going to tell you right now, this church was a crazy place. You had two groups of people going in there. First, you had the group of people that really embraced Paul's teaching. They liked him. They, um, they, they embraced his authority. They embraced his apostolic function and role. And they really loved his ministry. But you also had this other group of people, the second one, that was led by false ministers within the church who were very critical of him. They were critical of his authority. They opposed his apostolic function and role. And they openly slandered him. So you got two worlds living under this church called the Corinthian church. And, you know, the church is, you know, just by, it's just morally corrupt. False teachers spreading false doctrine, deep division. And I mean, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you had people that would be worshiping together on a Sunday morning and on Monday or Tuesday, they're in the court suing each other. I mean, this is how nuts it was. But even in the chaos and how crazy it was, the gifts that are on operation in this church. So this, that, you know, that this just gives you like a snapshot of what Paul's dealing with this. So he writes this letter, this authoritative letter addressing their behavior, because Paul recognizes that the, that the church is malfunctioning. So he writes this letter, and he's kind of strong with them. You know, and as they receive the letter, they challenge Paul, and they challenge Paul's legitimacy as a leader based on how he wrote the letter. So he writes this hard letter. He's like, listen, you all need to get it together before I get there, or you're going to see the, you know, the boldness of me in person. But when they write the letter, the people discredit him because it's how he wrote the letter. You see, they're noticing that Paul's a little bit different when he writes a letter. They're like, you know what, Paul, you're a tough guy when you write a letter, but when you're with us in person, you're weak and you're timid. What they're not seeing is they're seeing two sides of Paul in this. They're seeing the authoritative Saul that happens to be in the letter, but he's also representing the, the kindness of Christ in person. And what this church is doing is mistaking his kindness for weakness. He's demonstrating Christ in front of them while he's trying to bring correction because you know what? When you do it in kindness, it works. But he's not saying like, if, if that's not working, he will go the other way too. See, this is what a strong leader does. He's demonstrating the love of Christ in both of these situations. A strong leader not only teaches, but they have to bring a level of correction when they see it in the church. And it's not to push people down or knock them down. He's pastoring them. He's showing them because he realizes that, that at least part of the people in this church, their spiritual lives are on the line. They're far from God, and it's about their souls now because, you know what, at the end of the line, he knows what's going to happen to them, and it's not good. This is how much he loves them. He's shepherding them, and he's responsible to them. And the one thing before we move on I want you to take away from this is, is well, is this. You know what? We're not responsible for the actions of anybody. We're just not. But we are responsible to each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord. I'm responsible to you. You're responsible to me. You can't control what I'm going to do, nor can I control what you do. But the reality is, we've got to be careful. When, if I'm responsible to Derek, my function for him, if I see him doing something that's wayward, it's to go to him responsibly and hear me gently and lovingly not through condescension not through judgment not through criticism not through being harsh but to guide them lovingly back into the scripture that's the first option that's the best option because i don't see people coming to the ward when we just point out everything wrong it's not going to work just make the chasm bigger to where you can't build the bridge now so for us we have to lovingly, if we love one another, and we're a family here, okay? 
We have to uh, be able to approach people, but it's the method in how we do it. Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers, therefore, if someone is caught in sin, you who are spiritual should what? Restore him gently. Not through condescension. Never going to work. So at this point, it was funny because as I was thinking about this Corinthian church and how not they were, I'm thinking about this and I'm like, these people have seemed to forgotten who Paul used to be. Because in the not too distant past, when Paul was Saul, he was going around executing people just like them. So I'm thinking this, and my mind goes down these crazy roads sometimes. And I said, you know what? I wonder how many times they're going to be poking him in the eye when he's trying to help them out to when the flesh comes up, Paul becomes Saul and he starts tearing the place up again. Which it doesn't happen. This is where my mind seems to go sometimes. But we all know what happens. He's on the Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9. On the way to go killing more people, by the way. Jesus knocks him off his horse by the power of the Holy Spirit, knocks him to the ground, blinds him, and gets a hold of his life. And it's an amazing story. You should read it. He sends him to this guy's house named Ananias. But before he gets there, he's, God gives, the Holy Spirit tells Ananias, by the way, I'm sending Paul to you or Saul to you. And Ananias is a little shaken up by this because he's like, Lord, are you aware that he kills people like me? And then God says, receive him in. And then, you know, the rest of the story, Ananias takes good care of him. It's a wonderful, powerful story of transformation, what God could do in the blink of an eye. But the thing I want to focus on this morning for the rest of our time is to look at verses 3 through 6. You see, Paul didn't take an argumentative approach or posture when he was with him because, he, again, he knew it wasn't going to work. He understood getting into a carnal, fleshly battle with them in a war of words wasn't going to work because, you know what? He knew the spirit that was at work behind the people. He had a decision to make. He discerned rightly what is making them do this. And it's a demonic thing. This is why he says, we'll get there in a minute, but this is what he says in verse 3. He says, we're human, but we don't wage war as humans do. Not in this situation. He's pointing out the difference between spiritual warfare and warfare that's done in the natural world in the flesh. And you know what? The more you read the girl, the, the more you read the word and the more you pray, you will learn how to discern which is which. Stuff is going to present you like you want to get into it, and you're like, oh, I see what that is. So now you fight a different way. He goes on to verse four and he says, in verse four, he says, the weapons that we use, they're not natural. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy every false argument, stuff that's starting to come into the mind. And he's pointing out to them that you need to implement the right kind of warfare and the right, right kind of weapon and strategy in that kind of warfare. You know what's going to happen? It's like if you show up to a gunfight with a knife, you're dead. It's not going to work. You don't have the right weapon of war. You're going down. So we have to understand what we are dealing with. And the problem I think that most of us has, and I think this is partially a growth thing too, because I didn't step right into this. And I think most people learn the process way of life, stepping into things and learning along the way. The problem is we often don't recognize the spirit that's at work in the opposition of the person opposing us. So that we see them, they're getting loud with us, they're not being very nice to us, and what do we do? We want to step in the flesh. Because you know what? We're offended now and we take it personally, as opposed to stepping back and just saying, wait. So this is when carnality comes in. It's fueled by pride. It's fueled with lack of understanding what we're dealing with. It's, it's our ego that gets in the way. I heard a great preacher say this one time. He goes, you know what ego stands for? Edging God out of your situation or your battle. You decide to go it alone, you're gonna go it alone. He's like, all right, I'll step back. I'll be here when you need me. And I'll tell you what, the enemy knows if he can get you to fight a spiritual battle in the flesh, we're gonna lose 100% of the time. Amen? We have to know this. 
He also knows that the flesh is always weak. You can't fight over here when he's over there. We have to go there and take control of the situation. Amen? The enemy knows that if he could keep you in the flesh, in the carnal, but he also knows this, that the minute you decide to make a choice, step into your authority, step into the empowerment that Christ put in you at the point of salvation with the Spirit of God that's in you, he knows he's going down 100% of the time. He knows this. He knows what you possess at the point of salvation. But the reason why he comes at us so much is he challenges us because he goes, I don't think they know what they have. So I'm going to go try to run them over. And so many of us end up on our backs if we just rise up in a minute and say, no, 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 no. Let me tell you something. I've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm free. I have the power of the Holy Spirit within you. I, in me, I take authority over that. And I'm telling you, the thing will shut down. It has to at the name of Jesus. But we just got to exercise it. Amen. And I love this because, again, you know, Jesus said this to his, to his disciples in Matthew 10, 1. The Bible says that Jesus got the 12 together. And listen, he gave them authority over, over unclean spirits. You know what that word over means? That's a place of dominion. When you receive Jesus, you're already over and step up in a place of dominion over the work of the enemy. It's positional. Are you guys with me this morning? So I want you to see something. You have dominion over unclean spirits and to send them out, get rid of them from you or that are kind of hanging around or somebody else, you have that authority. Listen, I got to tell you how powerful this is. When we do a healing water session, I was standing right over there with somebody and it's oppressive, dark. Uh, dude, I'm going to tell you right now, this is the first thing I saw when this, this person came up. I don't want to tell you who it is. But they came up and all of a sudden you could just see this like, you, you ever see a Grim Reaper robe? Yeah. All right. Yeah. This thing was over them. And I'm like, oh my gosh, the Lord gave me a little snapshot of what I was dealing with. And the minute I just said, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over that right now. Be free in Jesus' name. And then all of a sudden, it was just like someone lifted it up and dropped it behind him. And it was draped around them. And then this exaltation just came out. They were like, oh gosh, how powerful. Like freedom hit them instantly. That's what I'm talking about. It's not me. All I did was operate in the very thing that Jesus said I couldn't operate in, and the enemy had to leave. And, it, and thankfully, and I said to her, listen, don't let it back on. Don't put it on again. When that thing comes up in the rear of its ugly head, you got to use your authority and do the same thing. How dare you try to come and attach yourself to me? That's how we have to demonstrate this. Family, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in us. The same authority and power that Jesus walked in on the earth is in us. So now we can work 1 Corinthians 10 verses 4 and 5. So you know, you know what a stronghold is in that? Let me tell you what a stronghold is. A stronghold is erected one lie at a time. I want you to picture a bricklayer building a wall of bricks, taking a brick mortar, brick mortar, a lie. One lie at a time that we receive. We receive a lie here. We receive, we receive a lie here. So all of a sudden, we're just building this wall of bricks or lies, if you will, that all of a sudden goes over our head. You know what? You can't see the other side. You no longer see truth. Because in the moment that you can't see truth and you're blinded from it, that's where deception sets in. Deception is one of the most demonic things I've ever seen in my life because you know what it does? It tells a person that they're actually doing okay. It tells a person that, you know what? It's okay that you're, that you're standing in and, you, okay, deception works this way. It's a place where people justify and rationalize their ungodly value system. And it's strengthened by the lies that they receive. They'll tell you every reason, no, I have to do that. It's a justification of why they need to do whatever they're doing. It's a deception. And I'm telling you, you can tell them all day long to you blue in the face. And you know what? They will have a reason and a response to give you, and it'll be a good one. And the only thing that's going to break that is through the power of the Holy Spirit, fasting and praying for that individual. Amen? Until they see it. Verse 5 says, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps us from what? Knowing God. You know what it says? It says we got to take it captive. 
So I want you to see something here. Paul is using a military metaphor here. He's describing what it looks like when one country invades another country. The invading company comes in. They knock down the stronghold. They push back on the resistance and just get in and they destroy the area. They destroy the city. It's exactly what Babylon did to Israel. They came in, wiped out Jerusalem, took all the people and made them come under a new government. So they take captive people that are still alive and they make them subject not only to a new government, but they got to bow a knee and obey the rule of that new authority over them. So I want you to hear this. This is exactly what we have to do when a negative thought, a demonic thought, or something is trying to make headway into us. You take that thought captive and you make it obey your governmental rule, which is your authority in Christ. Are you guys with me? You're the authority in you. You are the authority of Jesus Christ. You have the authority of Jesus Christ. You don't bow to that thing. It's under your government rule. And when you make it bow, it has to. Amen? I know I'm giving you a lot here, but I'm telling you, I think this is going to free a lot of people. This is so heavy on me this week. Somebody is going to learn how to war differently because I'm going to tell you something. The days are growing short. I'm telling you. The enemy is not going to stop. He's going to try to make a headway, an inroad, any way he can. And we have to learn how to stop it. And we have to learn how to thrive and be successful, okay? And this is it. So we have to do this with every thought, deception that comes into the mind or before it goes into a deception. And if you're not sure what it is, ask somebody. Ask someone to come alongside and pray with you, amen? And also, to win this kind of a battle, this is where biblical understanding is key. Because if we don't understand what we're dealing with and we don't have any biblical knowledge, we don't have any Bible, um, if the Word of God is not ingrained and embroidered into our spirit and our heart, it's a losing fight. You can't fight this in the flesh. I'm reminded of Jesus when he, in the Gospels, in the Synoptic Gospels, every one of them talks about it. After a 40-day fast, Jesus went into the wilderness. He was led in there. And the devil tempted him in every way, shape, and form that we are tempted. But you know what he did? He stood his ground. He stood in his authority. And I want you to know something. When Jesus walked the earth, he didn't walk. He walked as God, but he traded off the Godhead to walk as a man. Because if you walked as God, we're not God, so then we're not going to make it. So he walked just like we did. The Bible says he walked in every way that we do, yet without sinning. So I want you to see in this context when he's walking in the desert and the enemy is bombarding him, what did he do? He operated in the authority and he quoted the word of God. It is written, Satan. It is written, Satan. It is written. That's how we overcame and that's how we have to overcome. It was a, it was a display of what we're supposed to do as believers. Amen. So one of the things that we can do I want you to realize that you are the gatekeeper of what comes into your spirit. You're the gatekeeper. So some of the things that we could do in the natural to help promote a life of godliness and victory. Number one, you got to guard what you put in the eye gate. If you ever question whatever you're watching on TV, if it's good or not, why don't you just run it through the word of God and see what God says about it. And say, Lord, if there's something here that's not right and you don't want me to watch, would you put your finger on it and show me what it is? I promise you he will. We also have to be listening. We have to be careful what we put in our ear gate. Amen? And this is where we have to be careful about what we recite, what's been spoken over us. And by the way, the different things that have been spoken over us in the context of a lifetime, those things can be uprooted with the same method. That authority works for the stuff that's already been planted richly in your life. You can wipe out a whole field of like junk in a whack by saying, in the name of Jesus, I yank up everything that has bound me, that has held me back from knowing who I am in you and the outflow of my life in you. And it'll come right on out. It works the same way. We have to guard what we put in to our ears. We gotta be careful what we like, what's your self-talk sound like? 
What are you feeding your spirit on a day-to-day basis? The two most important conversations you're going to have on a daily basis is the one that you have with yourself and the one that you have with him. And the one that we have with him has to match the one we have with ourselves, Because if they're incongruent, we're going to have an issue. We have to guard about the music that we listen to. I'm touching stuff, and this is where things get quiet because people like their stuff, you know what I mean? So I'm going to leave it in your hands. But we got to guard what we download into our, our spirit by virtue of what we listen to. I remember years ago when I was a resident director over at the Baba College. It was probably 12 o'clock at night, and I'm walking the floors. And um, I walked by this room, and I, can, I mean, the beat and the rhythm of the song was coming right through the door, and it was just loud. So I just stopped for a second, and I listened to it. Didn't recognize the author. And then the guy started to sing, not the student, but the guy in the, the music started to sing. And I'm telling you, it was littered with profanity, objectifying women, just anything not, not of God. I mean, let's just put it to you that way. So... I gave a little knock at the door and I said, hey, um, who's, who's the artist? He told me who it was. Never heard of the guy before. And I'm like, are you aware of the lyrics? And he said, yes, I'm very aware of the lyrics, but I don't listen to it for the lyrics. And I looked at him and I said, well, you can't really separate the two. I know you want to hear the rhythm and the beat, but the other's coming in. And he respectfully disagreed with me. What the young man failed to connect with was that the rhythm and the beat and the hook of the song became the delivery system for the poison. And he never saw it. And, um, you know, and I am sure this was in strong rotation in his playlist. And an interesting thing happened. Um, Before he had graduated... He had said to me, he goes, it was soon after that I kept listening, but I went to the Lord and I prayed. And the Lord showed me how foul that was and what I was feeding my spirit. You know, and and I just, I gave him a hug. I just commanded him for it. You know, most people just brush you away and think you're nuts and all that sort of stuff. But the reality is I was grateful that, yeah, it was exactly planting a seed. And he ran with it, which was even better. The last thing I want you to know this morning is that you cannot control what comes into your mind. You can't, but you can control what you do with the thought that enters the mind. You got to be careful what you're feeding yourself because the more you feed yourself with whatever it might be is the thing that's going to take root and be rich in your life. That's why you got to guard what you see and what you listen to. But when these thoughts come in, you can either run it down the road of a motion picture, which isn't good, or you can shut it down again by stepping into your authority and saying, how dare you try to attack me like that? This is where James 4, 7, and 8 comes in. Submit first to God, resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. He has to. Submit first to God. Go to God first. Resist what he's doing, and the devil has to leave. Verse 8 in the beginning says, draw near to God at that point, and he will draw near to you. That's where it comes in. And I'm telling you, those thoughts will go far from you. Amen? So we have to do that. And if you're not sure, again, the Lord gave me this late last night. If you're not sure what you're watching or if you have questions about what you're listening to, you're watching, I got one verse of scripture you could run, that you can use as your grid, you can use as your filter, you can use as your rubric, if you will. Philippians 4.8, listen to this. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, good report. Is there anything excellent and anything of praise, of worthy of praise? Think of these things. So he's telling you how to align your thinking up. But if you check whatever it might be against that, those eight things right there, you're going to be well on your way. Because you know what? If it's truthful, does it merit? Does it have truth? Secondly, is it honorable? Is it honest? Right? Is it approved by God? And these are the Greek terms here. Pure, not defiled, lovely, uh, lovingly, or lovely, pleasing to God, admirable. Is it spoken by the Spirit? Is it of good report? Is it excellent? In other words, is it moral? Is it righteous? 
And he said, these are the praiseworthy things. These are the things that we think of. Amen. I thought that was such a sharp thing that the Lord showed me there because that covers it all. So when you have something, you're not sure, say, Lord, is this thought? Where is it coming from? And he'll show you, I promise you. But you got to go to him. You got to make a choice for that. All right, here's how I want to close. The other thing the Lord showed me was this. He wanted me to speak and declare over you, to download into your spirit who you are in Christ Jesus. So I got about 35 of these things that I pulled together. They're all based on scripture. I'm going to read you what the scripture is, but I'm not going to give the scriptural reference. If you want that, I'd be more than happy to email it to you. But here's what I want you to do. And I want you to receive this like as an impartation for real. Because when you get, see, this is, let me tell you, when, when we allow this stuff to impact our thinking and it sits down within our spirit, when the enemy starts knocking at your door, you're already empowered. You're already walking and recognizing and walking in your authority because we're putting it in. Are you guys with me on this? All right. All I want you to do is shut your eyes. If you want to raise your hands and say, as I'm reading this, say, Lord, I receive this. I receive this into my spirit. This is who I am because your word says this to me. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. The Lord would want you to know this morning that you are loved by him, that you are righteous, that you are righteous, you are the righteousness of God, that you are safe, that you are more than a conqueror, that you are part of God's kingdom, that you are healed from sin, that you are no longer condemned, you're an overcomer, you're not helpless, you're born again, you're a new creation, you've been redeemed from the curse of the law. You're qualified to share in his inheritance. You're completed in God. You're the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. You are God's workmanship. You are seated with Christ in heavenly realms. You are blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. You're a child of God. You're assured that all things work together for your good. You've been established, anointed, and sealed by God. You're a citizen of heaven. You're born of God and the evil one cannot touch you. You are hidden with Christ in God. You have not been given the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You are holy and blameless. You're forgiven. You're included in Christ. You're sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. You're a saint of God. You are salt and light of the earth. You are a personal witness of Jesus Christ. You're God's co-worker. You're a minister of reconciliation. You're alive with Christ, and you've been raised up with Christ, and you are a member of God's household. Hallelujah. And Father, right now, I just pray as I close here this morning, Lord God, I pray over every person here this morning. Father, I pray fresh fire over them. I pray fresh faith, fresh zeal, fresh enthusiasm, Father. Father, a deeper passion for you, O oh God. I, your, I, I, I declare your, your favor and your protection, O oh God. I pray your great strength, power, and anointing for them to go the distance in you, O oh God, that they would be a reflection of you, Father, in every way, shape, and form. Father, in the moments, Father, of weakness, let them know they're forgiven and they've been established in you, O oh God. Father, I pray that, they, that you would encourage them and refresh them this morning. And Lord, that they would nurture it and, and build upon what you're doing here in this service over the context of the week, O oh God. I speak life over each and every one of them, Father. Every one of our family here today, your kids, your sons and your daughters, Father, let them receive your message this morning. Let them receive your word into their spirit, oh God. And let them walk out of here enthusiastic, empowered, oh God. By your spirit, says the Lord. And Father, we receive this in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.